Let's go ahead and get started. Again, huge apologies, everyone, for our technical difficulties this morning. However, we're very excited to be here together with you. And thank you so much for joining us and for, for waiting through this delay with us. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the TFIS website. Welcome to the second webinar of our four-part SEER webinar series. SEER stands for the U.S. Offshore Wind Synthesis of Environmental Effects Research Project. The project is being funded by the U.S. Department of Energy Wind Energy Technologies Office, and the work is being jointly performed by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, PNNL. My name is Rebecca Green. I'm a senior scientist with NREL, and I will be presenting during today's webinar along with my colleague and teammate, Mark Severy from PNNL. The two topics which we'll be covering today include the introduction of new offshore wind farm structures with effects on fish and shellfish ecology and benthic disturbance from offshore wind foundations, anchors, and cables. Next slide, please. By way of today's agenda, we'll start with a brief introduction from DOE, then for each of the topics that we'll be presenting on, fish ecology and benthic ecology, we'll have about 40 minutes each, maybe a bit less with our delay, to provide a topic overview, have a panel discussion with our external experts who have joined us today, followed by Q&A in which we'll try to address your questions, and then followed with some brief closing remarks. So with that, I would now like to introduce and welcome Joy Page to provide an introduction. Joy recently became the new Environmental Research Manager for the DOE Wind Energy Technologies Office. She previously served as the Director for, new, for Renewable Energy and Wildlife for Defenders of Wildlife, and we're very excited to welcome her in her new role with DOE. Joy? Thank you, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Well, nice work under pressure. I'm glad that we're able to kick this off. Um, it wouldn't be a webinar series if we didn't have at least one hiccup. So glad we got through that. Um, anyways, welcome, everyone. I am so pleased to be here and excited to kick off the second of four in Sears webinar series. Again, I'm Joy Page. At the Department of Energy, I manage the Wind Energy Technology Office's environmental research portfolio. And I really think this effort is incredibly important. We had over 300 people on our last webinar, which is further evidence of the interest. And guess what? It's already uploaded on Tethys. I checked today. Um, and that's on, on underwater noise and entanglement considerations. So if you missed it, you can still check it out. So for quick background, I'm going to try to do this on all of these webinars quickly, just so you all know the context of what these webinars um, are being done under. So the objective of SEER is to build relationships and share science among the offshore wind environmental community on both coasts. And through that stakeholder engagement, we're trying to summarize our understanding of the science, monitoring and mitigation in a way that's broadly accessible, prioritize knowledge gaps in research, and also collaborate to fill those research gaps. Um, so next slide, Rebecca, or whoever's managing it, Mark, thanks. So there's three components of SEER. The first is a series of research briefs uh, that PNNL and NREL have painstakingly condensed to seven key issues. And while we know there's a lot of other uh, science syntheses being prepared on these topics, I wanted to make clear that these briefs are really meant to be accessible to the broader public, to communities, to policymakers, to advocacy groups. So it's really meant to distill the information. And we are so lucky to have an amazing cross-sector science and technology committee. I'm so grateful for who are sharing their time, knowledge, and comments with us in developing these briefs. The second of the three components you can see is our webinar series. Again, this is the second. And these webinars build off the briefs, but allow some interaction and allow for the stakeholder community to hear from the scientists and ask your questions, which there'll be an opportunity to do so on Zoom if the platform keeps working. So, And then the final component is two workshops. Um, and these are to identify the research priorities. Uh, the one on the East Coast is, is tightly coordinated with the Regional Wildlife Science Entity, and the West Coast, PNNL and NREL are just starting to get planning on that, and we're looking forward to that next year. Uh, so again, at DOE, I really see this work as critical deployment. 
particularly if we're going to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. We need to be working together and communicating and aligning our investments. And when I say communication, I really mean that. So if you're concerned, curious, have any issue, please reach out to PNNL, NREL, or myself. I'm always happy to brainstorm. Um, so again, thank you so much to NREL and the PNNL teams. And again, to our Science and Technology Committee. I'm really looking forward to the webinar and really excited about SEER. So thank you, Rebecca. Excellent. Thank you, Joy. Next slide, please. Next slide. Fantastic. So let's go ahead and dive into reviewing the state of the knowledge on the topic of the introduction of new offshore wind farm structures and effects on fish ecology. Once again, I'm Rebecca Green. I'm a senior scientist with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where I work on a variety of offshore wind activities. I previously worked at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management for nine years as part of the Environmental Studies Program. My PhD is in biological oceanography, and I've worked in the marine sciences for about 25 years now. So it's really a pleasure to have worked on synthesizing this topic and to present to you today. The focus here is on the placement of new structures and associated implications for colonization, aggregation, and artificial reef effects for fish species. The topics of noise, EMF, and other stressors are covered in other briefs and will not be discussed today. Following these slides, we'll also be talking with our panelists, uh, Drew Carey and Stephen DeGrayer. Our, synth our synthesis, let's see, the long, sorry, the long history of studies that offshore structures, including energy structures in the United States and Europe, provides research that informs our understanding of offshore wind development and the possible effects on fish and shellfish ecology. Many of these analogous studies have documented the colonization of the newly introduced habitat by hard substrate species. Based on these studies, we can say that the introduction of new structures in the marine environment can introduce different communities of organisms and alter the food web, alter habitat by providing novel, hard, vertical and horizontal substrates that are rapidly colonized by epiphytes attract fish and establish new predator and prey relationships, and host a range of organisms from the epifaunal organisms that settle on surfaces with succession to other types of uh, fish species, including demersal fish associated with the bottom, benthopelagic associated both with the bottom and the water column, and pelagic fish fishes such as black sea bass and Atlantic cod associated with the water column and surface waters. These shifts have been considered both an enhancement of the local environment by supporting biodiversity and a detriment by, alter, by altering the local ecological system. So both considerations need to be taken into account in citing offshore wind farm projects. Next slide, please. The implications for fish communities that result from the placement of offshore wind energy farms depends on an overall understanding of both the effects on fish habitat and resources, as well as the broader eco ecological consequences. The placement of new structures during offshore wind farm construction can temporarily or permanently alter habitat directly beneath the foundation and in the vicinity of the foundation. In this case, we're talking about fixed bottom foundations and we'll talk about floating in a minute. The footprint size and habitat effects of turbines depends on the foundation type, the materials used in building the foundation as well as the scour or erosion protection, and the sediment type where the foundations and associated infrastructure are constructed. Sediment footprints range in size from the smaller footprints associated with jacket type foundations to larger footprints associated with monopiles and gravity foundations in these latter cases due to a scour protection which is often used around the foundations. Next slide please.
A widely studied consideration for offshore wind farms has been the potential artificial reef effects of turbine foundations, including colonization and aggregation around the structures. Artificial reef effects refer to a structure's ability to mimic natural reef environments and the associated attraction of fish and vertebrates, invertebrates, shellfish, and other species, as shown in the figure here. Increased abundance of certain fish and shellfish species have been observed near offshore wind turbines and their scour protection. For example, in Europe, reef effects have been observed at several offshore wind farms, including in the North Sea, and include observations of increased abundance of certain fish and shellfish, shellfish species, including crabs, cod, sea bass, and mackerel. In the U.S., observations at Block Island Wind Farm around the turbine foundations have indicated dense mussel aggregations, organic-rich sediments, and the presence of juvenile crabs, black sea bass, bass, and other native benthopelagic fish. However, not all fish species are attracted, and some cases have observed no effects on fish abundance at wind farms. For example, the studies we just referred to in the North Sea have shown that Atlantic cod are attracted to foundations, but there was no evidence in that case for the common sole, as one example, uh, being attracted to the monopile habitats. Other potential effects include sp potential spreading of invasive species via stepping stone or effects or um, islands in the natural environment, altering species migration patterns due to the attraction to foundations, altering hydrodynamic processes such as circulation and mixing and potential effects on larval transport, and with seabed, seabed disruption potential to release contaminants. Next slide, please. Lessons learned to date from the offshore industry have implications for the physical presence of structures associated with both fixed bottom and future floating offshore wind energy foundations. With regards to both fixed and floating foundations, offshore wind farms may protect fish species and habitat based on analogous studies by limiting or excluding fishing in an area, uh, specifically um, around the foundations themselves, establishing new reef habitat, and functioning as fish aggregating devices. Uh, floating offshore wind farms are still relatively nascent, although with a few, uh, future floating uh, scenario in our sites, uh, we do need to consider this, even though less is known about potential effects on fish ecology. Given our understanding of the potential technologies that will be used, floating farms include the following considerations. Direct effects on fish may be lower due to limited, the limited vertical profile of foundations, as shown in this figure here. And smaller sediment footprints are likely associated with the types of mooring lines and anchors that are used. Next slide, please. Many years of monitoring at European offshore wind farms has provided valuable guidance for assessing fish and vertebrates habitat and in other environmental consideration as the US offshore wind industry grows. A combination of monitoring techniques can be utilized to assess changes in fish ecology around offshore wind turbines, including effects on fish species abundance, distribution, and community composition and the factors responsible for observed changes. Recent offshore wind fisheries monitoring guidelines have provided several key takeaways, including that clear research objectives and hypotheses are required to guide experimental methods and design, and that approaches need to be used for investigating changes between pre-construction or baseline and post-construction or operational phases of offshore wind development. Two statistical approaches which can be used are the before-after control impact or BACI approach and the before-after gradient or BAG approach. BACI compares an impact location or reference site with an unaffected control, sorry, com compares an impact location with an unaffected control or reference site before and after the intervention 
and bag samples along a gradient with increasing distance from the turbines before and after the intervention. The figure she here shows application of the bocce approach at the Block Island Wind Farm. Next slide, please. A variety of monitoring concepts have been applied in Europe and are also being used in the United States with, with some differences such as, as based on species types and habitat types. Monitoring methods need to build on existing sampling programs. These methods can and have included trawl surveys, scuba diving surveys, hydroacoustic surveys, and fish tagging or telemetry work. Gill nets, traps, or pots can also be used, such as for sampling lobster with associated statistical analyses, as we've discussed. Best management practices include siting away from sensitive habitats, such as protected areas, and away from known fish migration routes, as well as minimizing seafloor disturbance during con construction and installation activities. Foundations can be designed for for target fish populations and habitat needs to promote beneficial effects. And proper burial needs to be considered for mooring anchors and cables, such as at floating wind farms. Next slide, please. There's a lot to be learned in the United States from the multi-year studies that have been conducted through rodeo and the lease agreements at the Block Island Wind Farm. Um, these studies were used to separate the farm's effects from regional changes and environmental conditions. Study elements which were included and described in Carry at All 2020 um, may apply to future studies, including early stakeholder engagement with fishermen, cooperative research with commercial, including with the first commercial fishing industry, use of methods consistent with regional surveys, sampling, whether in this case with the bocce design or the bag gradient design we described, and adaptive monitoring based, monitoring based on the data collected and feedback from stakeholders. Next slide, please. So moving forward as the offshore wind industry continues to grow, including in U.S. waters, there are a variety of research questions that will apply. And these are some examples of those questions including as distilled from the NYSERDA state of the science development of reports, um, including for benthic activities. So some example questions are, do fish density and species composition change significantly around offshore wind turbine structures in different regions and with different foundation types? What are the processes or mechanisms that are responsible for any observed changes in, in fish communities? at turbine structures? How do we separate or disentangle changes in fish communities at, at offshore wind farms um, from those due to other environmental factors such as climate change? In terms of ecosystem functioning, are fish communities on these turbine structures isolated from or connected to each other at larger scales across turbines and across multiple wind farms? And finally, does the artificial reef effect export measurable amounts of energy and biomass to the wider ecosystem or only serve uh, basically locally as aggregating devices? Next slide, please. Moving forward, it's important that we consider collaborative approaches with regional scientists and the fishing industry um, to ensure sampling methodology uh, can be assessed within a regional context. Longer term stock assessment surveys, such as those con uh, conducted by the National Oceanic and Mat Atmospheric Administration or NOAA Fisheries, provide baseline data sets and will need to continue, albeit with reshaped design designs, to best inform assessment of offshore wind farm effects on fish distributions. Linking monitoring at the local and regional scales will also help us to collate the knowledge needed to understand offshore wind farm effects and inform effective mitigation strategies. Next slide, please. 
So with that, that concludes my opening remarks and um, overarching takeaways from the de development of our educational research brief. I think I've bought us a bit more time probably by speaking rather fast, but it's my pleasure now to turn to our panel discussion and to introduce to you our external subject matter experts and panelists, Drew Carey and Stephen DeGrayer, who have both um, agreed to serve on this panel and who also inf helped to inform and review the development of the educational research briefs themselves. So with that, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Drew Carey, who is the CEO of Inspire Environmental, where he leads a team of scientists including benthic ecologists, fisheries scientists, and experts that have worked on offshore winds since 2009. He has worked globally on the assessment of human activities on the ocean with an emphasis on the role of seafloor habitats and marine, on marine resources. Drew has a PhD in marine geology and biology from the University of St. Andrews. And next, I will introduce Dr. Stephen Negreyer, who is a senior scientist with the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences. Since 2008, Stephen has coordinated the marine ecology and management team with a broad expertise on rocky shore fauna and invasive species, marine mammals, seabirds, and underwater noise, all embedded in an ecosystem management context. Stephen coordinates the Winmon B monitoring program, which we refer to in the briefs on environmental effects of offshore wind farms in Belgian waters. He has a PhD from Ghent University. So uh, please welcome Drew and Stephen. Hello, can you hear me? In here. I can hear you, can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes I can. Thank you for joining us. So um, to get us kicked off, uh, we have a couple of questions before turning to questions from the audience. Um, the first question we'd love to hear feedback on are what lessons learned or current understanding would you like to highlight for environmental effects associated with offshore wind development and fish ecology? And uh, maybe we'll go ahead and start with you, Stephen, if you don't mind. I don't mind. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And thanks for the nice overview. I really appreciate this whole initiative about you know, the synthesis of the, the synthesis of all that knowledge into these knowledge briefs. I think is going to be very much appreciated by many people around the world. So thanks a lot for that. Um, now, if, if you think about knowledge gaps, I think we should start with saying that a lot of there is already a lot of knowledge out there and a lot of knowledge okay is mainly coming from europe but lots of that understanding is extrapolatable to uh, to the us not all but there is quite a lot of things that we already know but there are a lot of things of course we still do not know and some of these issues are very crucial to think about the impact of social and fish ecology and one thing i want to highlight over here for the sake of saving some time of course because we can you know, we, we can spend the full day or two days talking about that, but we don't have time for that. But initially, I want to, to, uh, to bring up here that may be of interest to, you, to the audience is that if you think about or if, if, if you look at data on uh, attraction to offshore wind farms of particular fish species, then as you said, okay, well, there is attraction for some species, some species seem not to be attracted, or there is no, there is, and, and, and some species may even seemingly be uh, avoiding offshore wind farms. And the point I want to make here is that um, there's a much different view on, on um, that I know, let's let me start over again. There, the way of collecting data is much um, going to steer our view on whether there is traction or not. Uh, we have long been thinking that uh, flatfish, for example, typical, you know, sandy, soft sediment species, that they are not attracted to these offshore wind farms because they represent hard substrates. And actually, the data we got also showed that flatfishes seem to be avoiding these offshore wind farms. We found them in, well, maybe the same densities or even lower densities and fishery surveys clearly show that there are low densities, but actually if we look at, uh, if we have a closer look at smaller spatial scales and you really look at, you know, the area very close to turbines, and now I'm thinking, I'm talking about tens of meters, then actually their densities are increasing there. 
So, you know, some of these contradicting views on whether fish are attracted or fish are avoiding an area of, or, 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 or whether an offshore wind farm does not have any effect at all is much dependent on the way of collecting our data. And I think that it's very important to, uh, to be aware of that and to really approach the, uh, the issue of attraction at the appropriate spatial scale. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and turning to you, Drew, are there certain lessons learned you'd like to highlight for us? Yeah, I'd actually like to build on what um, Stephen was saying. Um, I think you mentioned some of the uh, studies that we've conducted here in the U.S. So that, that's the, the sort of information or lessons learned that we have here. And uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, the initial studies of fish ecology were really driven by the commercial and recreational fishing community's concerns and interests, quite rightfully so. So those studies were developed in collaboration uh, with uh, those communities. They utilized standard commercial uh, fishing techniques. Uh, those particular fishermen were not comfortable uh, developing a, a so-called bag design, so we adopted a, a backy design. And uh, it was a very robust study, but I think what's, what we learned from that is that um, despite a tremendous amount of effort, those techniques where you're either trawling or setting traps uh, near turbines and uh, you know, some distance away, uh, we did not see generally a wind farm effect uh, beyond a typical annual and spatial variation. So that doesn't mean there weren't effects. We certainly saw more black sea bass at the turbines. Um, we saw more mussels and those mussels spread. But when you look at catch, when you actually are thinking in terms of the potential effect on fishing nearby, um, the wind farm effect was really uh, buried in the natural variability. So you either have to adopt a very, very intensive fishing effort, in other words, harvest so many species and, and fish that that study alone may have an effect. Or if we begin to explore some of the questions that you've asked here, I think we need to develop methods side by side with assessing the effect on, on commercial stock and recreational fishing by looking at smaller scale effects. So I think Stevens Institute and a few others have really pioneered looking very closely at that localized effect. And you've mentioned a number of different pieces there, how we begin to what I call follow the signal. Uh, we know that there is a, uh, a fish response to the benthic response and there is energy uh, cycling going on, but we need uh, to dive into that in more detail. And what, what we're both saying, I think, is a contrast between um, one scale of study and one that is getting more towards causality, what is potentially driving uh, potential changes. And, and they fall, in my mind, into two very different buckets. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you um, for, those, for those thoughts. And when we think about um, scales and causality, and how we best study those changes, um, that well uh, takes us into a follow-up question that I'd like to ask you both. Um, and that is what existing or state-of-the-art um, knowledge and tools do we need to inform minimization techniques associated with fish ecology and offshore wind farm development, especially um, as we look towards development in the US Atlantic, Pacific Coast and other US regions. So any thoughts on the types of, of tools and uh, methods that, that we should be considering? And sure, what, start why us don't I go ahead and, yeah. and dive in and then I think Stephen can follow with, because they are a little bit ahead of us in terms of, of developing techniques. I think in our context, it's really important to focus on the value of habitats. And when I say habitats, I'm not just speaking about seafloor, I'm talking about the whole pelagic system as well as the seafloor habitats. So a lot of the consensus that is emerging is that we need to really focus on the function of 
uh, both the uh, seafloor or the vertical structure habitat itself, the organisms that are there, and then how that gets played out into the food web and, and the flow of energy. The other thing I would emphasize is I feel strongly that we need non-extractive techniques. So instead of harvesting hundreds of thousands of fish, uh, we need to really begin looking for non-extractive techniques. There are obviously some that exist. Some of them are still evolving and developing. Um, and I think Stephen can speak a little more to some of the specifics, but from a policy perspective, I think the better we can be at learning about response to this introduction of, of structure uh, without having to kill lots and lots of animals, that's generally a good thing. Yeah, thank you, Drew. Yes, I can uh, build on to what uh, Drew just said. Huh? Particularly if it is about these non um, these non destructive techniques, there are a couple of uh, of non destructive techniques that may be relatively easily applied to uh, studying fish ecology in offshore wind farms. And that's of course when you make use of these uh, of these um, acoustics acoustic techniques. And with uh, with tags, you can tag fish, and you can really have a very nice view of what they are doing, where they hang around, uh, how far they go, how long they stay, and that's the kind of information we may get from fish. I think that's the, the highest level of detail we can ever get from, uh, from fish. Um, and it really, you know, provides us with lots of information as to tackle this production, this attraction production hypothesis. You know, this attraction production hypothesis is on the table for decades now, huh? not in the framework of, um, of offshore wind farms, in the framework of artificial reefs. Um, and we still seem not to be able to come to a conclusion there. While actually, if, if, if we really dive into a, deep, a detailed view on what fish are doing there, uh, how long do they stay, where do they move, uh, if they move outside the wind farm and so on, we can really get a very nice view on, on their fine scale distribution. It may partly explain the difference between fishery surveys and scientific surveys, like wider scale fishery surveys and the small scale scientific surveys in relation to offshore wind farm, but it would particularly help to, um, to better understand how actually this whole effect, the artificial reef effect, which I think still is a production effect in the end, how it translates to, whether it translates, and if it translates, how it translates to the population dynamics of the fish at the scale that which, uh, at which a fish stock or a fish population is functioning. And that's where we need to get to. Uh, we definitely need that sort of information. And of course, you know, once you, you have these detailed investigations of where fish are or where they hang around, you know, the whereabouts of the fish actually, uh, if you combine that with, uh, with condition in these shells, um, if you combine that with uh, stomach analysis, then actually you can really get a very good view on, uh, on where they go. And actually, there's a nice study in Belgium that is now focusing on, uh, on, on a flat fish. I never thought that flat fish would be attracted to offshore wind farms. Well, they are. And there is the one PhD student that really dives into the, uh, the details of one specific uh, species that is placed. And I'm pretty sure that within a year of, from now, we, we have some very nice publications out there that really demonstrate that, yes, we can do that right up to uh, the spawning ground, the effects on the spawning grounds, and actually the contribution to the population uh, productivity. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen and Drew. And we look forward to those publications coming up. I think you partially, I'd like to turn, yeah, uh, congratulations and keep on doing good work. Um, I'd like to turn to just a couple of questions in the chat. I think you partially answered one of the questions we received uh, as to whether or not there's work looking at impacts from offshore wind farms to a, essential fishery habitat, such as spawning grounds. So maybe we'll turn to another question. Um, when it comes to monitoring and mitigation methods for offshore wind turbines, can you speak to the role of and opportunity for public-private partnerships to better understand effects and effective mitigation? So any thoughts on public-private partnerships for, for this type of work that you'd like to highlight? Might be easier for me to start with that since uh, okay. Stephen is in a little different uh, uh, political situation, I guess. Um, 
I think this is already happening. Uh, there are probably three levels, maybe even more, of how uh, data collection, let's say broadly speaking, is, is being done. And I think you've mentioned already, Rebecca, that during the leasing process, there is a requirement to develop uh, monitoring plans. I, I consider those to be essentially compliance monitoring. Did the EIS that predicted certain effects, did it get it right or did it get it wrong? Are you looking for uh, the effects that were predicted in that EIS? That's a, that's a standard process within our regulatory context. Those get developed and reviewed and negotiated. And so those are, are really driven by the projects themselves and what potential effects they may have. Um, on a much broader scale, there, we all have acknowledged there's a need for regional information. And so the collaboration between individual projects, between regional entities uh, that have already begun to be established, um, these all interact with private uh, entities, whether it's a consulting firm like ours or other uh, entities out there. Um, it's not all being done by public uh, institutions. The universities are heavily involved in all of those projects. And then another tier is the standard stock assessment. I think some folks have mentioned that that is a, a backbone of, of the National Marine Fisheries Service activities. So as the ocean uses change, those stock assessment techniques and approaches are necessarily gonna have to change. And some of that can be informed by the, the additional uh, coordination and regional data collection, but there's really no substitute for the, you know, sort of straight up stock assessment work that has to be done. Uh, it's just gonna have to be evolve and be informed by um, the use of the ocean in ways that in this region at least, and here I'm talking about the Northeast at the moment or just the Atlantic coast, we haven't had fixed structures offshore like the Gulf of Mexico. So there is a, a shift. There's some things that, that have to be addressed relative to just the presence of structures. So uh, there's many, many opportunities for public-private partnerships. Um, you know, we are about to publish the results from the Block Island Wind Farm uh, Fish and Lobster Survey. That one was a public, part. you know, there's a developer funded it. Um, the uh, agencies engaged in developing the plan and reviewing the plan, um, the commercial fishermen were engaged in, in conducting the work. So I think that's really been a thread through the entire process. Excellent, thank you, Drew. Um, and that's, that's very clear from your description. Um, Stephen, do you wanna say anything else on this topic? Otherwise we'll maybe just within kind of the next minute or two and then we'll, and then we'll go yeah. Wrap up. Yeah, maybe very briefly. Um, yeah. I, I just want to mention that in Belgium, we try to, and that's together with the Netherlands, we, uh, we are now trying to set up a uh, data collection collaboration between fisheries and, uh, and scientific institutes, the Fisheries Institute, but also the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences. And of course, data are exchanged, but those are data that would specifically help us to understand, to, to, to have a better view on the marine ecosystem and better understand the marine ecosystem. Not that much inside offshore wind farms because fisheries is prohibited in, uh, in Belgium offshore wind farms. But what we do is we actually develop uh, sensors that, uh, that, you know, that are just, you know, hanging on the tools of the fishermen on, the, on, on, on their nets and so on, or cameras that are just, uh, viewing the, uh, the catch, there are some privacy issues there, but we will be able to solve that battle. That will provide us lots of information that would directly come from fisheries without the fishermen having to directly invest uh, time or financial means into that. And I think that that's something that may help us a lot as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. And with that, we'll go ahead and conclude this particular topic. I really want to thank you both, Drew and Stephen, for your contributions here and great work in the field, uh, helping us to move forward in an, in, in an environmentally responsible manner. So I hope you have a great, both have a great day and we will go ahead and move on to our next topic. Thank so, you. Turning it thank over. You. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Re Hi, Rebecca. This is this is Mark. Are we going to do a, a brief Q and A here? Or should we move into the next presentation? Let's go ahead and move into the next presentation. I think, in the interest of time. Great. Okay. Well, thanks, Rebecca, and everyone. And um, my name is Mark Severy. I'm a scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. I'm glad to be joined by two subject matter experts, Monique LaFrance Bartley and Jan Van Everbecke, who will be joining me as panelists to discuss this topic at the end of the brief presentation. First, I would like to um, begin by presenting an overview of benthic disturbance disturbances for offshore wind foundations, anchors, and cables. I'm going to discuss several different ways that the effects to the benthic environment can occur at offshore wind farms. Many of these effects are site specific and can result in negative or positive changes depending on the environmental setting. So just to begin with an overview, the benthic habitat is a combination of the physical, chemical, and biological conditions that provide food and shelter to organisms living on or in the seafloor. Benthic organisms include flora and fauna with a diverse set of characteristics, including their size and mobility. For example, these organisms include anemones, sponges, crabs, mussels, corals, sea stars, snails, worms, and, and many more. Ground fish are also considered part of the benthic community, but the discussion right now will really focus on the benthic habitat and the invertebrates that live there. Um, rather than fish, which we just discussed earlier today. Offshore wind farms can create direct and or indirect changes to benthic habitats during the construction, operations, and decommissioning phases of offshore wind development, which will be discussed um, right now. Um, today, we're just going to provide an overview of several different benthic effects from offshore wind turbines listed here. And so I'll just start walking through these sequentially. First, the infrastructure for offshore wind will take up space on the seafloor and invariably remove some existing habitat. Habitat loss is caused by the presence of turbine foundations, scour protection, concrete mattresses, anchors, or other components that are installed on the seafloor. Overall, the extent of direct habitat loss is typically small relative to the total wind farm area. When habitat loss occurs, Mobile, mobile organisms may be able to move to new locations, but sessile or stationary organisms may be crushed or smothered during the installation activity. When a turbine foundation or scour protection is installed, this creates new hard substrate that can be rapidly colonized by some organisms. For example, aggregations of blue mussels have been found on the turbine foundations at Block Island Wind Farm and at other wind farms in Europe. Vertical structures such as these found, turbine foundations support colonizing communities like mussels who support, whose presence can impart changes on the surrounding seabed and benthic community. Mussels can fall off the vertical structures and expand along the seafloor. Fecal matter can become deposited in the surrounding sediment. And over time, there have been observations showing an increase in total organic carbon, mineralization rate, and a decrease in the sediment grain size around offshore wind turbines. The result of these changes can lead to a habitat that supports a different benthic community than before the installation. This habitat conversion takes place over the course of several years and may follow several steps throughout the process. Long-term monitoring can help identify how organisms react to the changes in their habitat. Offshore wind infrastructure can also provide opportunities for non-native species to colonize or spread. Non-native species can be introduced from vessels that are visiting the wind farm for installation or maintenance act activities, and the structures may provide a location for these non-native species to live. Monitoring at existing offshore wind farms has found some instances where non-native species are present, but in these cases, the species were already um, present at that location before the installation of offshore wind turbines. Existing evidence shows that non-native species have not outcompeted native species at these offshore wind farms. Continued monitoring efforts can help track and identify if offshore wind infrastructure allows these species to further expand their range. Seabed disturbance <clears throat> occurs during installation of offshore wind components when sediment is moved or shifted during construction. 
Disturbance occurs following the installation of foundation, scour protection, anchors, or a subsea electrical cable. Starting with the foundations, the extent of the disturbance depends on the type of foundation and installation method that is used. When scour protection is used to limit erosion around the turbine foundation, installation can cause local, localized disturbances or loss or conversion of habitat around the base of the foundation. Lastly, installation of subsea cables will cause a local disturbance along the burial route. The effects of the disturbance depends on the burial method the sediment type and the local oceanographic conditions. The footprint of the disturbance also depends on the installation method, according to the width of the, of the burial that it, that it may be affecting, as well as the length and the number of cables that are installed. But generally this area is small relative to the entire wind farm area. After installation of these components in soft bottom locations, natural movement of sediment caused by ocean currents helps the seabed recover to pre-construction conditions. Scars and depressions caused by construction equipment have returned to conditions that match the surrounding unaffected area. Thus, the physical disturbances caused by installation are typically followed by recovery of the benthic habitat as sediment move, moves back into these disturbed areas. After this initial recovery, conditions may continue to change as the benthic community adapts to the new offshore wind infrastructure as we discussed earlier. Next for the water quality and turbidity portion, installation of these offshore wind components can also suspend sediment into the surrounding water column, <clears throat> in the surrounding water column, which could affect marine life by smothering them, clogging filtration systems, or decreasing visibility during the construction process or, or the decommissioning process for that matter. Monitoring suspended sediment during construction at several offshore wind farms actually found that the installation activities did not create significant sediment plumes in the surrounding area due to the use of best management techniques that minimize the creation of these plumes. At the end of the lifetime of an offshore wind farm, the equipment must be fully decommissioned unless there's a plan for partial decommissioning that is approved. Full decommissioning involves removing the entire offshore wind structure, while partial decommissioning leaves part of the structure in place. Decommissioning causes similar effects and disturbances as construction and is expected to follow a similar recovery and transition pattern. Lastly, there are some additional considerations to benthic organisms that should be mentioned here at the bottom. Noise was covered actually in a separate topic during the first webinar of the series, but we mostly talked about noise in relation to marine mammals and fish. Um, in the benthic environment, not all invertebrates have the ability to detect sound, but noise can uh, elicit a response in some of them. Overall, noise is not expected to be a primary cause of mortality. Subsea cables also generate a small amount of heat, but the changes to the local water temperature are so small, less than 100 of a degree that the effects on marine life will be insignificant. <clears throat> Next, if contaminated sediments are disrupted during the installation process or if contaminants are released somehow during the operation of the wind farm, undesired particles can be introduced into the food chain. However, there's siting practices and best management practices that can be used to help minimize any of these effects. And lastly, I, I just also wanna mention that I'm not discussing the potential effects on benthic organisms from electromagnetic fields or EMF um, from subsea cables, because that topic will be covered in a separate webinar um, completely in early 2022. Monitoring the effects of on the benthic habitat can be accomplished through many methods. There are a variety of methods that can be used to monitor these environmental changes. Acoustic surveys can detect small changes in depth and surface characteristics of the seafloor sediment. Water quality samples or optical techniques can identify sediment plumes and suspended solids. Biological samples can be used in soft substrates to assess the benthic and faunal community structure. Sediment samples can evaluate the particle size, organic content, and contaminant concentration of the sediment. 
And further, video or photographic surveys can be used to characterize the habitats and identify stationary and mobile organisms in the area. Best management practices can be implemented to reduce or avoid negative effects on benthic habitat. Siting turbines, anchors, and cables to avoid sensitive habitats and species is very important to minimize any harm. Construction activities can be timed to avoid seasons with sensitive biological processes. Construction methods that limit disturbance to the seafloor and have a small footprint can further reduce the extent of any effects. And lastly, using nature inclusive designs for scour protection or other equipment can help improve the way that native organisms interact with the artificial infrastructure. <clears throat> While research is continuing to monitor the benthic effects of offshore wind farms at existing locations, several key research questions remain. <clears throat> research needs that have been identified by others are not fully documented in this list, um, but I list here a few questions. I'm gonna skip over talking about all these because we do have a, a panel discussion that will mention um, kind of future research needs. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and move on forward to that. Now I'd like to continue the conversation with the panel discussion with two subject matter, matter experts. I'm joined by Monique LaFrance Bartley and Jan Van Everbecke to discuss a few questions. Monique is a marine ecologist working with the US National Park Service. Previously, Monique was at the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography, where her research primarily focused on benthic habitat mapping. Monique participated in studies to site the Block Island wind farm and co-led a monitoring study to investigate benthic changes resulting from installation and operation of the offshore wind farm. Jan is a marine ecologist working at the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences. His work investigates the effect of offshore wind farms on the functioning of marine ecosystems with a focus on food web dynamics and biogeochemical cycling through a combination of field observations, lab experiments, and ecological modeling. Thank you both for joining me today for the panel discussion. I have a few questions lined up for you both. And so why don't we first start with Jan? I'm not sure if you're able to get your video and sound on, that would be great. Um, there you are, thanks. Um, so the first question is what lessons learned or current understanding would you like to highlight for the environmental effects associated with offshore wind development and benthic ecology? Um, so can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. And thanks for the nice uh, for the nice overview. Um, <clears throat> I think a, a key message that we that I, that um, actually what we learn here from what we see in the European wind farms where we are already investigating for for quite a while um, is that it takes some time uh, before actually changes can uh, can can be seen or can can be measured, um, and that's because there's a certain number of steps that have to happen. Um, before these things actually can 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 be seen, I'm talking about benthic ecology now. I'm a benthic ecologist, where we saw after a certain while and first uh, very close to the turbines that indeed the, the properties of the sediments were changing. Yeah? As you said, they were uh, getting enriched, um, more organic material was, was was coming in there. Uh, the fauna was changing as a response to this. Uh, the fauna had like a, a feedback loop toward to, towards that. Um, and, and all of a sudden, we started to realize that um, that this would lead to the, uh, a change in how the sediment is actually functioning. Yeah? These this important chemical transformations that are going on in the, in the in that sediment were actually changing. And now we see, we, we understand clearly that this effect, while we firstly saw it, noticed it very close to a, a, a turbine after a while, uh, that we are now realizing we actually uh, show uh, that these effects actually cover already the size of an offshore wind farm and go beyond this, uh, uh, and, uh, even, even, outside, uh, even outside the wind farm. So as Drew already said, there's a redistribution of energy. Uh, we call, I, I mean, I, I look at it as organic matter that is taken out of, out of the water column by these, all these animals that are feeding on it. And then uh, these animals use it to grow and reproduce as well, but they also produce fecal pellets and they are heavy, they sink to the, um, to the um, 
to the sediment. And it seems like this local organic enrichment um, is actually uh, going beyond the scale, the scale of, of, of a wind farm. So the idea is really to, to, uh, to, to, to look at the long term, uh, at, at, the, at, the life, at the lifetime of, a, of, a, of an offshore wind farm and at the combination of these offshore wind farms, if they would be, a, if they would be close to each other. That would be it at the, at the moment. Thanks, John. And then, uh, Monique, I'll pass the same question to you. What lessons uh, learned or current understanding would you like to highlight? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Uh, to follow up on Jan, I think it's also important to consider that changes can occur at very small spatial scales within an array. So at the Block Island Wind Farm, for example, um, about two and a half years after the foundations were installed, we saw changes under one turbine, turbine one for reference, and we saw that blue mussels were aggregating on the seafloor and along the graded structure. But then just a few miles away at the other end of the array, turbine five, we saw no change at all until the following year. And by that point, the change at turbine one, there was about 50 centimeters deep of dense mussel aggregations um, just in just over that one year time. So I think, you know, even though the scale is relatively small, there can be different hydrodynamic conditions that cause changes to occur um, at different time scales within the array. Thanks, Monique. And then sticking, I guess, with, with some of your work at Block Island Wind Farm, what existing or state-of-the-art knowledge and tools do you need to inform minimization techniques associated with benthic ecology and offshore wind development? Sure, yeah, uh, a few thoughts on that. And just to kind of follow up on the scour protection and the idea of using the nature inclusive designs, I think that's a really great idea. Um, something we found surprising in our work at the Black Island Wind Farm is that the concrete mattresses that were used as scour protection never became colonized. They remained bare the whole time throughout our study, which was you know about four years post installation. So that's really considered a loss of habitat, you know, a negative ecological impact. Um, so using material that's more ecologically friendly is definitely something that should be considered. And then the other idea, uh, just in terms of tools and how we can collect data more effectively and efficiently is during our study, we piloted an autonomous float camera system that took high resolution photographs every few seconds. And the system's able to maintain a consistent altitude from the sea floor. So the images, um, we're all taken at the same scale. And if there's enough overlap among those images, we can make high resolution mosaics. And there's a lot of potential here to calculate seafloor rugosity um, from the imagery to collect, you know, high resolution imagery across large scales of uh, space and time. But I think some of the logistical and the technical aspects of that camera system still need to be worked out. So, you know, I think it's something to consider for the future instead of direct sampling. Great. And then Jan, for the same question to, to you, what existing um, techniques or knowledge tools um, can help inform uh, the, the, the benthic ecology effects? I think we can go two ways. Eh? I mean, it's uh, just adding on what Monique just said, this nature inclusive design, uh, knowledge on this, you can help uh, or uh, enforce the, 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 the the system um, as it is there. Um, there's two ways of thinking about nature inclusive designs. And it's like you, you add, yeah, you, you, you put additional st structures on the scope protection reef, on the scope protection layer or, or, on, uh, or on the turbine. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you can also think about not adding additional, uh, you know, artificial substrate in the, in the environment. But you can also think about, yeah, can, can we rethink the way we install scope protection layers? So far, at least in Europe, they are there uh, because of um, engineering reasons and they are installed in such a way that, that, that economic costs are minimized as well. But if you would think about changing with complexity in, 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 within, those, um, within those scope protection layers or the dimensions of that scope protection layer or the variation in, 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 in stones and so on um, that we are using then, we are adding habitat complexity where uh, locally then uh, some uh, some some fauna can can benefit from this is one way and then the other way is I think it's by by predictive modeling if we start to understand 
then I'm talking about larger scale. So we, we, we observe these changes. And if you start to understand the mechanisms, eh, why, are, why are these changes there and what do they mean for the, for the environment, we gain predictive capacity to upscale the effects of wind farms um, or turbines within a wind farm. So like in, in Belgium, we have a model study uh, where we have to, uh, where there's a new concession zone close to a protected habitat. And then we actually used our, our knowledge, uh, biological knowledge, very detailed measurements together with oceanographic modelers um, to actually test or assess uh, uh, what the best or the worst location would be of these, um, of, of these new turbines uh, with respect to the, to the habitat we want to protect. And then we can play with location. So this means micro siting within an area, but also with the numbers and dimensions of, of, the, of the turbines. And this is really, I mean, if you know where you don't want to have an effect uh, while you want to install uh, offshore wind farms, um, this, is, this is really helpful. And we are at, we are, we are at the infancy of this kind of, uh, this kind of research and, um, and um, knowledge. But I do believe that that close cooperation across fields of so biologists, ecologists, chemists, oceanographers is, is really a way forward. Um, so when designing monitoring programs, this, this should be kept well. It, it would be good if this could be kept uh, in the back of the head or bring it to the front of the head, actually, rather than keep it in, in the back. Yeah. Sure. And then Jan, what do you think some of the most, just maybe taking a step back and looking at um, a larger scale, what do you think the most likely cumulative effects would be for benthic ecology? And what are some of the challenges with analyzing the cumulative effects or predicting them? Um, that you, you, you're referring now to having multiple wind farms in a, in a, in a, in a certain area, I guess. Huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, um, where we are now with our, with our uh, upscaling uh, me measurements uh, or up upscaling uh, um, modeling efforts, uh, we, as I said already, you actually see changes within the wind farm, but also changes outside the wind farm, uh, where um, organic matter is practically is, is actually redistributed. Eh? So that's uh, the it is taken out of the water column by the animals living on the turbine, and it's giving back its sinking to the seafloor. Um, so you get this, this redistribution of organic matter, you get local enrichment, which probably will affect locally the food. And then this kind of knowledge can, can, can be used. Uh, do, we want to, do we want to limit this effect in space that you probably wise to, uh, to have as many wind farms or turbines in a certain area together, or do you want to spread this risk? Uh, well, risk. We want to spread this this uh, this this change and make sure it's not overlapping. Uh, that it might be it might be the advice might be to to um, increase the spatial distance between uh, between the wind farms. If you have the space in Europe, where we are having, uh, I mean, the Belgium wind farms and the Dutch wind farms are next to each other, and you really see the cumulative effect extending way into the Dutch part of the of the of the of, of the North Sea. Um, yeah, so this is mainly the, 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 the thing that I would be looking at for the moment. Sure. And, and Monique, do you have any, any points you want to add about cumulative effects? Yeah, um, I'll just build on what Jan said. And I definitely agree that some of the cumulative effects we'll see will be in the food web, food web dynamics. You know, we see um, species becoming present or more dominant in areas that they weren't so much before. Again, in the case of the Black Island wind farm, we have these dominance of mussels, and then that has led to other predators being present, um, scavengers and fish. So just changing the overall um, ecology of the area to some degree. Uh, and then the other thing that I think, it, again, towards John's point is that, you know, we see these mussel aggregations and we see them starting to like move away, drift away, being carried away by currents from the turbines. And where will those end up? And will they form mussel reefs elsewhere? Will they just kind of die off? Like what happens to those aggregations that do move away from the turbines? And if we have multiple wind farms that are, you know, closely spaced, relatively closely spaced, like that would probably influence the end result um, of where mussels end up and their overall impact. Um, but then, you know, then again, we have increased mussels, we have increased water filtration capacity. Um, 
So there's, we really have to think about the ecosystem as a whole, even if we're just trying to consider benthic changes. Um, and then the other thing I just want to kind of note quickly is, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about the idea of positive and negative change, but I just want to also respond to that. And I would argue that some changes are not really positive or negative, they're just different. And I think that it's important to recognize that whether a change is positive, negative, or neutral really kind of depends on your perspective. And that's why it's important to include a diverse range of people in these sorts of conversations to discuss what questions we want answers to, how studies should be conducted, and the trade-offs that we're willing to accept as a society, and also to come up with innovative ideas. So just kind of putting a plug in for, you know, making sure everybody's perspective is understood and, and considered. Sure, that's a, I, I think a really good point on understanding how um, changes actually influence different um, perspectives and, and making sure we consider all of that. So with that, um, I do wanna open up to some Q and A um, from the audience. I, I should have mentioned this up front and maybe Rebecca did that um, everyone's welcome to just drop their um, questions in the chat. And if we can, we'll, we'll try to address them. And if not, just send Rebecca or myself an email afterwards and we'll uh, make sure to get back to you. Um, but one question I saw come in that I, is actually kind of interesting and takes a different perspective on benthic effects was kind of summarizing that we're looking a lot at the, what are the biological processes and what are the effects um, that, that we're, what are the effects that we're seeing there? But are there biological processes that may concern wind farm developers and that developers want to ensure they're monitoring and better understanding the costs and risks associated with that? And this is for either of you, if you, if you have a thought. Uh, the thing that comes to my mind immediately is uh, making sure the structures are designed to withstand the weight and drag forces that the colonizing organisms on the structure itself will present. So uh, I think that's already pretty commonly considered, but um, worth noting. Yep, I agree. And then, like I said, sorry if I'm remaining a bit silent, I wasn't sure I understood the question correctly. Um, but I mean, there's one, what I also want to add, I think, to what, to what Monique said is that there's one thing in constructing wind farms, but it seems that you also have an obligation to take them out again uh, at a later stage. Mm -hmm. So um, if there, I think this decommissioning should be taken into account already when, 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 when building them. Now, if there would be a positive effect, identified or a change that can be perceived as positive and whatever we, we call it, eh? then it makes no sense. Then it would be, that it makes no sense. It would be very much a, a, a pity if that effect is gone, if you, after taking, uh, after taking these wind farms uh, or the turbines uh, out. As an, as an example, we, are, we now came to realize here, at least in a Belgian wind farm, that Within that the changes within a wind farm in that sediment actually contribute to combating climate change because the sediments there accumulate more carbon. So you take out carbon from the carbon dioxide cycle. Um, this effect is there and it's, it seems to be rather significant during the lifetime of a offshore wind farm. But if all that sediment is going to be disturbed again for the activities of taking the, wind, the, the turbines out, then that effect is the positive effect, and I think this should be called a positive effect, is lost very, very soon uh, after uh, starting the, 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 decommissioning, the decommissioning activities. So think ahead, I would say, um, in, in, in constructing your, your, um, well, your wind farms, the offshore wind farms, um, in, uh, in new concession areas. Thanks. And one more question that came in was, what are some examples of construction methods that limit benthic impacts and how can these be evaluated? So this kind of, a, I mean, it could be a very broad question, whether it's disturbances during installation or even um, changes to habitat over the lifetime of the, of the wind farm. Uh, Jan, do you want to go for it? I'm a bit on thin ice here because they constructed the first wind farms before I started working with, with, with wind farms. But I do remember this 
there's, there's, a, there's a report about uh, first gravity-based wind farms. The seafloor had to be prepared a lot for that, so that means moving sediment away back and forth. Um, while if you could go to, to techniques that really uh, limit this preparation where you can pile uh, turbines or the up turbines without too much disturbance, then I, I think that um, that would be um, advisable. And at the same time, it's minimizing. I think Monique already touched upon that. It's whatever technique that minimizes the loss of the original habitat is a good technique. If you come to a technique where that that, that can be decreased, where that in, where that impact can be decreased because that original habitat has a function. Uh, and has organisms in there that sustain that function. Um, if, you, if you decrease that size, then through whatever method, then um, I think this would be a good option for the constructing and for constructing wind farms. Yeah, I think also that you know, can, thinking about the type of foundation is worthwhile. Um, at Block Island Wind Farm, we have the jacketed structure, so there's four legs plus the crossbar. So there, you know, it's a, a large structure that we've put in the water, and that's colonized again by the blue mussels, dominated by blue mussels, which you know then settle to the seafloor and, and disperse larvae. And so now we see the settlement of mussels on the seafloor. So potentially, if you had a monopile or you know a foundation that has a less of a footprint then you would see less of those benthic impacts. So potentially something to, to consider there. Great, thank you both. Um, I don't see any more questions or comments coming in from the chat. So um, I wanna thank you both for your participation both during the webinar and then also your assistance for reviewing as the, the documents and slides as subject matter experts. Um, with that, I'll move on to make a few acknowledgements and, and say a few thanks to some people that really have helped this project move forward. Um, this includes, in particular, the U.S. Department of Energy, Wind Energy Technology Office. We've had a wealth of guidance and information through, through their office, including from Joy Page, Jocelyn Brown Saracino, and Naomi Lewandowski. So we really want to thank the DOE for their support. Um, also, all of our external subject matter experts, including the panelists that were so gracious to be included today and provide their insight. And then members of the SEER Science and Technical Advisory Committee that really guides the whole project. This is people from industry, environmental NGOs, and many others that help um, guide our project and what topics we should really focus on. And then lastly, I want to also note, well, two things, really. One, if you have three things, how about that? Three things. If, if you have further questions that come up or that we weren't able to discuss today, feel free to reach out to myself, Rebecca, or others that have their contact information listed on the slides. Um, the slides will be available on the TETHIS website, and there's a SEER page there. Um, it was just posted in the chat, so um, please go there if you want reference to the slides and, and eventually uh, the, the webinar recording will be posted there as well. It may take a week or so to get up, but um, you can certainly go back. I know we had a few technical difficulties this morning. So if you were late to join, um, there's some reference material there. And then lastly, we will have two more upcoming webinars. Um, they will occur in early 2022. We don't have the date set for them, but the first one will be um, discussing vessel collision and the effects on marine life and then also EMF uh, effects on marine life. So that will be covered in early 2022. And the second webinar will be on bird and bat interactions with offshore wind energy developments. So we're really looking forward to providing those webinars as well. And I'm sure you'll get an email or a message through TFIS about that. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, I will be happy to wrap up uh, now and look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar in the new year. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.